staff platoon sergeant, and he served in the European Theater of Operation. And Manny, we're ready to begin now. Go okay. ahead. I'll read from the back of my discharge. That might help get an idea. Uh, it says here that I entered the service on the uh, 13th, and I also uh, got inducted on the same day. In other words, I was drafted, but I didn't take the, the two weeks off to settle my affairs. I wanted to get in. Now, the way it went was this. Upon joining, I was put in a train and taken to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. There I got my uniform, threw away my clothes, the uh, war I, clothes I wore, and headed to south in a train for Camp Bowie, Texas. When I got to Camp Bowie, I was, it was the middle of the night, and we were uh, lined up and told we were tank destroyers. And it was a tough thing to look at because they had a picture of a panther eating a tank. And I didn't know what I was getting in for. It turned out it was the 817th Tank Destroyer Battalion. I was there about two weeks, started my basic, and the next thing you know, I got awful sick. I had the spinal meningitis, and everybody thought I was going to die. I passed out, and uh, I remember falling, and somebody must have taken me to the hospital. And I woke up, I don't know how many days later, and I looked across the room, and there was a white, ghostly looking figure. All I could see was eyes. I knew right away it was my mother. And I said, what are you doing here? She said, oh, I just come down to see you. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I was in the hospital for about a month, and then I was sent home for a month. While in the hospital, I was in bed with Joe Blundell. Not many people knew that. Uh, Joe Blundell came in, and she was on a USO show. And since there were very few of us that survived that disease, we had no penicillin or anything. She said, I'll give you something to write home about. Move over. And she jumped in bed with each of us. There were four of us. And then after that, <coughs> I was sent to home for a month's leave. Came back and went with the tank destroyers. While I was at Tank Destroyers, I became a gunner of a, uh, I think they called it a three-inch gun. And a gunner had an easy job, that's why I wanted it. The gunner carried a tiny little telescope, he hooked it up on a gun, and he sat down on a little stool. The cannoneers all jumped out, and they had to open the trail legs, lug the gun around. All I had to do was screw a little thing on and say, I'm ready. And then they would holler, clear, set. And I'd say, fire. Then I'd take my little tool and go back in the truck, a half track. I was there for a while, and then they decided I was smart enough to go to college. So they sent me to ASTP up at University of Illinois. At the University of Illinois, I realized I, this is what for me. I wanted to be a soldier. So I looked over the situation, and if I flunked everything, that sent me away. But I realized English I could use in my college, so I studied for English, passed that, flunked everything else, they threw me out, and I wound up with credit for English, and that's all I needed. I didn't need the physics or anything in the physical education field. From there, they sent me to Little Rock, Arkansas, where I became a member of the 278 tank, or excuse me, 278 combat engineers. And uh, I worked my way up to staff sergeant, and I liked the engineers very much because we did things constructively, and I liked the building of bridges. I, we were mainly a bridge building bunch at roads, and that's what we did in Europe. Uh, we learned to build Bailey bridges, wooden bridges, 
take care of roads that were falling apart, kept the uh, traffic moving from front to rear and so forth. And we, and we did a lot of demolition. I like that. I became very proficient with uh, demolition material. Okay. And, well, let's uh, go into where uh, into after your training. Yeah. You you uh, do you remember about when you went to Europe and where did you land and take us through the steps to uh, Europe? Okay. Uh, we left New York and I don't remember the dates. I do have on my discharge here. I didn't study that I should have. Uh, date of departure for Europe was 27 September 44. Arrived October the 14th, and on the boat, I was a champion boxer for about 10 days. And as a result, I got a uh, little special treatment like extra cigarettes, and they gave me a pair of stockings once. And uh, I could roam around where other fellows were pretty well. I could go to see the cooks and so forth. But anyway, uh, about one day out of Southampton, I thought it was going to be my last fight, champion big shot, and they wheel out a guy named Germano, who was a professional. I didn't know it. I got knocked clean out, so that was the end of my career as a boxer. But we landed in Europe on uh, January 23rd, or no, no, uh, October 10th, 44. How, how do you want to go? Uh, th I'm in England now. Okay, talk about England a little bit, what, okay. what you did over there. They sent us to a place called Swanage, England, which was a lovely little coastal town. And uh, the people were great. No central heating. This is something I never saw before. Every room had a fireplace. There was all kind of smoke coming out in the mornings if it was cold. It wasn't very cold much. And we did our usual running and uh, training and all while we were there. And at night we would go into town and uh, legal, legal, go to a bar. What do you call that? Pub. Yeah, pub. And we'd have a couple of brews with them. And they always were getting pints of everything. And their stuff was dark colored. Sing a lot of songs with the limeys, and uh, it was just nice. Now, a, a lunch there cost six shillings, and it was usually the same thing. A piece of toast loaded with baked beans. That was a tea. And that's what you got for lunch, usually, if you went out to lunch. And we were there for, I would say, three, four weeks. Uh, I think, I don't know if I got any dates on that about when we left, but we left Swanage in convoy, went to a boat and got on it in Southampton and went up to Rouen, France. And on this boat were some Al Algerians, I think they were. Uh, they were, we didn't like them. And they would, when they ate their dinner, they'd put a canvas on the floor of the boat and dump their food in the middle and eat with their hands. Uh, we still were eating out of mess kits. Uh, we also, when we landed in France, we landed at Rouen, where at right where the boat parked was the place they burned Joan, uh, Joan of Arc. And there was a big circular thing there. Nothing stood up straight, just a, a round circle. And they told us that's where she was burned. And a, a lot of French fellows came one early morning. It was still dark. And they gathered into a group, looked like about 40 of them, and when they talked, they sounded real strange. They all were talking at once. And it, we started calling them frogs. And that's what they looked like, a bunch of frogs. Okay, we got off the boat, got in convoy, took uh, a two-day trip across France and into Belgium. After we left Rouen, we went convoy two days to Hermal in Belgium. When we got there, the captain said, and that was Captain Smart, he said, we'll put the whole company in this little theater and, and tomorrow night we'll do something else. So the whole company got in this theater. And uh, we put a machine gunner, 
out back. We didn't know what we were into. Now we had watches the same, you know, guard duty. And we're sitting there, and it's about, oh, 10 at night, and we hear this buzz, brrr, like that. And I said to my friend, Kid Top, I said, that plane sounds like it's awful low. And he said, yeah. And all of a sudden it stopped. And we, oh, he's going to crash. His motor stopped. Well, we didn't know it, but buzz bombs. And this was a buzz bomb. And it just went over the place we were staying and went off about, oh, three, four hundred yards behind the plane. And our ceiling of the theater come down a good bit of it. You could see the stars. It was our first time we saw a buzz bomb. And then we found out Hermel was on the route from Germany to the coast, and they were trying to get coastal cities in Belgium, like Brussels. But they could also aim it at groups like us. But we got used to them. They were called buzz bombs, or V1s, they called them. And that was our first taste of uh, anybody getting shot at or something. So then, uh, the next night, this is interesting, I think. The next night, we decided we weren't going to stay in that theater, so we went into town, which is right in the whole street. And myself and a couple guys went into this uh, house, and a man and his wife were sitting over here. And we sat here with our rifles on our lap. I didn't know what he was going to do. He kept his mouth shut. She kept her mouth. So all night long, we just sat there and looked at each other, and some guys dozed off. And so after a while, we it became daylight, and we left. Nothing happened. So I went back the next night because it was a good place. Well, it turned out that they were the Louis Lewis family, <clears throat> and she became. She called herself my mother in uh, Belgium, and she wrote my mother a lot. My mother wrote her, and I got letters in a stack here from her to my mother about, she told my mother about me, and that she would kiss me when I went, when I left, like a motherly kiss. That's all in the letter, and I, it's kind of cute. So my mother would send her packages of food, and so forth. But the big thing there was they had a son named Joe, and he was about 15 or 16. And they were afraid, they were occupied for a while by the Germans. So they were afraid that Joe would be picked up and taken away. So they hid him in a hole in the barn, and they covered it with boards, and it looked like he wasn't there. At night, they would get him out and feed him and put him back. Well, they got to trust me enough to tell me about Joe, and we said, get him out, because, you know, the Germans were pretty far gone. So out came Joe, nice young boy, about 17 years old, named Joe Lewis, can you imagine that, a boxer. <laughs> so anyway, he became pretty good friends, and my parents would send him, uh, he went to college, they'd send him some money and some books. and. I guess if they were alive today, it would still be corresponding, but they're not, so they all died. I don't know about Joe, he might still be alive. Okay, from Hermel, we went to Aix La Chapelle, and that was a, another town on the way to Germany. And we worked out of there, going into woods and uh, building roads and bridges. We put up bridges pretty much anywhere where we thought they needed them to get tanks back and forth and so forth. And uh, in that town, I lived in a monastery, which I brought pictures. I would see we had trucks; we could go right into frontline areas and come out, but uh, we didn't have to stay up there like the infantry. So we could always have a place to come back to where the motor pool was and stuff. Anyway, we go to this, we're at the bar a lot. We used to go to whatever bar was available. We liked to listen to their trios, which was a bass drum, 
or a drum, usually a violin and an accordion. And there was a woman there, she looked to be about 30, and she told us that she worked in Aachen for the Germans when they were there. Uh, what'd you do? Oh, I was sabotage. I, what's sabotage? Turned out that's sabotage. And she was making uniforms for the German army, and her sabotage was to cut the seat out of the pants of the uniforms and box them and send them off. That was, that was what she did. Okay. So now we really haven't had much get shot at. That area where we were in was very quiet. We could ride well into the Herkton uh, Forest and come out again and do things, anything we wanted. And then one day, we go, every morning we used to go to headquarters, get a situation, how far could we go, or what, and so forth. The place we were yesterday was occupied by the Germans about 20 miles in toward us. And this was the start of the bolt. So, we were immediately had to go into a mode of getting bridges up and getting roads clean for retreating troops. And it started to snow, and it snowed continually for a long time. And they used to, as we would go past the cemetery out of uh, our, where we were stationed, we could see the trucks come in with the bodies. And that made me feel awful sad because it come in a dump truck, dump them out, and then they had grave guys that would take a little hammer, and if they froze in a funny position, they'd hit the, straighten them out and stick them in a bag. And, but they were very careful how they buried them, and that they had a dog tag on the cross so everybody know who was who. Well, uh, Christmas came during that period, this is what Kathleen likes to hear me tell about. And Overby was bound and determined to get us a hot meal while we were on the job. So we're out there working, and uh, here comes the, the truck with a kitchen in it, and we're going to have a hot Christmas dinner in the snow. So we're working, and here comes Overby. We get our dinner, we're all getting ready to eat, and we hear, and it's an airplane, but we can't see it. And we didn't know what, what it was. So anyway, over a hill comes this Messerschmitt, and he wiggles his wings, and he's flying about treetop level, and we hit the dirt with our brand new Christmas dinner spread all over. <laughs> now, Overby had just left, and he was about, oh, I'd say, a couple hundred yards down the road when that plane came over. And he realized what happened, so he turned his truck around. We got another chicken for dinner. And that was the end of that one. But I thought that was a funny Christmas. All right, now, next, where we go? We, we, went, we worked our way across from the Aachen to Cologne, and then along the river, bar, a bridge that uh, we captured called Ramagen. And uh, we, our outfit didn't capture it, but we, there's where we were going to make our crossing. And in the papers, it told a lot about the Ramaga Bridge. Our job was to bridge the Rhine with floating, uh, a floating potten bridge, and that we could do in about a day. And the Rhine's pretty wide there. So, uh, our job was, one of the companies uh, of the battalions had to build the bridge. They had a lot of guys, different outfits working on it. And they did build a bridge overnight, which could take tanks. Our job was a net above the bridges to keep the uh, frog bed, we thought, and floating stuff coming out of the river. Uh, we did. We built it. Well, I was left in charge of it. One night, uh, every night, <clears throat> they used that thing called bed check, Charlie. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he'd fly over, cut his engines, and he'd glide and start shooting at the bridges, trying to blow them up with his guns. 
and we would fire back. And in a letter I, that I'm giving Bobby, it'll tell about that. It looked like fireworks. There was so many. And we would always just lie under a truck or something because we were afraid of the spent shells coming down like rain. So uh, it was kind of touch and go. And we, as we built it, we lost a couple of guys because of uh, problems with the debt. They got caught on it and everything. And the next thing you know, it was a cross. Everything was mo moving smoothly. And I was left in charge one night of the net with a bulldoze driver and a couple of soldiers. Well, down the river comes a, a boat, an outboard motorboat with a Navy guy in it. And he had hung up about 30 yards offshore. And uh, his friend who had come ashore somewhere up the line said, can you help us get him off the net? I was bound and determined to because the night before we had lost guys like this. <clears throat> so we tried throwing him a rope, a line. That didn't work. So then we decided that, or I did, that what we'd do is pull the net a little tighter, say a big bow in it because of the curve. If we pull the net a little tighter, we might be able to move his boat closer to shore and that sailor would reach him. So we, I gave the order. I said to the bulldoze guy, pull. He pulled and that broke. Well, I thought I'd get shot. We had worked so hard. We had lost people putting it up. And I said to myself, tell the truth. The truth, I'll set you for. So I uh, told her to go back, and I went back to the captain, and I told him, I said, Captain, I said, I broke the net. He, uh, and he asked me how it happened, and I told him. And he said, forget it. So I think uh, it's cleared my mind to be able to tell the truth and have a good answer like that. And I have a letter here from him after the war, and they used to call me Josh because <clears throat> of Josh Cody, coach at Temple, and I used to refer to him a lot, he's a tough old bird, and they thought that was good, so all through the war I was Josh. So he said, Dear Josh, he writes, and it's in there someplace. All right, okay. Now, the way the infantry got over, a group of engineers, not our company, another one, got, had little speedboats. And the way I understand it, now I didn't see this, but they was told this the way it worked. They put eight infantrymen in, and one engineer that ran the little boat, and they'd get a lot of them in the water, get a head of steam, go with the current, and then take a right, and they will right up onto the beach, get right up with little runners under the speedboat. And then the infantry would pour out and advance. And this is the story I was told. Now, when we got across the river, to start the net, we had to put a dead man, which is a, a we had a big, big log sunk that we could attach a wire to. <clears throat> and the first thing I saw was a dead German. And it was interesting the way he was. I'll never forget the scene. He was in his foxhole, and he had a bullet hole right between his eyes, and his had beautiful hair, and there was a slight breeze, and he just sat there like a statue in the hole with his hair blowing peacefully. And of course, at that time, so it's another dead German, so you just walk away, do your job. But that stuck with me. I I've, I've never got, uh, we were shot at in a river, and that's a good story too, because as we were working in the daytime, we would get shot at, and they claim in the piece that Mr. Mastroni's gonna have, it's gonna tell about being shot at with this 88 millimeter cannon, and it was would shoot shrapnel. And we're in, a river in our boats, and you could hear it coming, a couple of shots, and that's the end of it. And what you do, you just lay down on your boat, and you can, 
here it hit beep beep along the side of the boat, but it, nothing ever happened to us. They had that thing go on them for about four or five days, and finally they found out how it, where it was coming from because uh, our infantry was way up and they were getting shot. And the Germans had left a spotter along the river and they had a uh, 88 millimeter cannon in a garage in a little town across the river. And what they'd do when the spotter planes were not working, they'd wheel it out, take a couple shots, put it back in the garage. So nobody could spot the thing. So finally they did get it, that settled that issue. Hmm. So anyway, that's just a little sidelight. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to tell you, now the real battling is over. As soon as you went to Germany, although it says it's a battle, it was a cakewalk. There was hardly any resistance at all. And the German people, as I was telling Mr. Bastroni, there was no uh, Nazis either. Nobody was a Nazi. Everyone you talked to, they, they told you how great the Americans were and they were glad you were here. And uh, one guy I can remember in Broken English said that we were lied to by the uh, German radio. They said, you you could never get here because you're running out of gas. He said, the first thing you do when you come in town is you take a can, 55-gallon drum type of thing, throw some water and dump gasoline in to start your fire. And every one of you is running around with rubber at the bottom of your shoes. They told us you are running out of rubber for your tires. He said, <laughs> so they like, well anyway, that was fun. And we met fellows who would say, uh, get a Nazi flag, great big Nazi flag, swastika, put it on the floor and, and it jump on it. That's what I think of the Nazis. But what did he have that big Nazi flag in his house for anyway? So that's the way it was. And every place you went into a town, or our group anyway, most of every, there'd be white sheets hanging out the window like surrender. And it was all over. And that's when we got to meet up with these war criminal guys that ran slave labor. And it was the way they, the one outfit I saw was it was a factory, and in the factory were many, many lathes. I don't know what they did made, but probably something for the war effort. And then on the walls of this factory were stacks of bunks about six high, and that's where they kept the men that they. Uh, I don't know where they got them. They might have been soldiers, I doubt. They might have been civilians they captured. And they worked there on these lathes. They slept there, they ate there. And to go to the bathroom, they had a hole in the wall, they had an out back, and sat on a board. And that was their bathroom. And we got the guys that uh, were running the place. And we made them uh, show us all what they did. And they had a series of cement bubbles, which had a crawl underground from one to the other. And if you were bad, they would put you in there and you'd have to find an empty bubble. And you'd sit in it, and then they'd feed you through a crack. And that's the way they punished bad guys, I guess. And we had all these men, they were in their 40s and 50s, that had run the place. And this is just about near the end of the war. And uh, Dutch soldiers were in charge of them, and Dutch hated the Germans. They'd do all kind of mean things to them because the Germans were awful bad to the Dutch. So when uh, Churchill made his uh, speech about the war is over, the Dutch had all these guys stand at attention for about an hour before uh, the speech. And if they moved, they'd bell them one. And if they did something bad, they liked to pull their ears, yank down on their ears. And, and uh, I saw the, a guy fell over, let him lay. There you go. I thought if the North Spartan all fall down, let him lay there instead of have to stand up. <laughs> but, 
But they stood at attention and listened to Churchill's speech. But the war was over. And uh, let's see. Uh, there's other stuff that I keep forgetting. But I think I covered most of it. So, so when were you when the war was over and what and do you remember specifically? Oh, you might like, see, when the war was over, the fun began. It really did. I became like a tourist. And they sent us to uh, rest areas and things like that. And at one point, they said, how would you like to go on vacation for a week or two? Oh, that's fine. So they gave me a pass and sent me to an airport in Frankfurt, Germany. I get there, there's a couple hundred guys sitting around. And the idea was, you got a number, and they, uh, we're, they were going to fly us out of there in the planes that did D-Day, uh, I think the C-47s. And the idea was, whichever group you're in, that's where you're going. Some guys went to Austria, Innsbruck, some went to London, they went all over. I was lucky, I got to Nice, France. So. I get in the airplane, and it, where the paratroopers sat, that's where we sat. And the uh, guy that was flying the plane came back and says, how do you want to go, through the Alps or around them? All of us. Which is faster? He said, through the Alps. Okay, through the Alps we go. Well, they shut the airplane door, took an old coat hanger, and wrapped it around the handles so the door wouldn't fly open, and off we go. Well, if you ever flew through the Alps, you don't fly over them, you fly through them. So, it's this airplane. So we're going through the Alp Mountains, right like this and that. And, oh, jeez. You look out the window one minute, you'll be in the sky, next minute there's a mountain here. So we're coming home, guy says, how do you want to go? Alps are around. <laughs> <laughs> no more through. But while we were there, they gave us clean uniforms, and somewhere in this stuff, Bobby's going to get, you'll see my scorecards, I played golf, I went fishing, I went drinking every night, I went to the beach, and by the way, I think that's where the bikini came from. It may have come from there or where else, but the girls didn't have bathing suits, so what they were getting was our GI uh, khaki towels, and they'd cut them up and make little shorts and little tops. And that's what they were using for bathing suits, most of them. And when we were in Heidelberg, the girls uh, were using anything. We said, <laughs> we, had a th we took the town hall of Heidelberg and made it into an NCO club. And we told the girls, if you want to come, you've got to be formal. We're not messing around with any cheapskate, you've got to be dressed. And then they would put on curtains or anything they had, uh, you know, to make it look like a long dress. And then they'd line up outside of the place, and you'd uh, go along. You want to go? Up, you'll be my date tonight. We'd take him in the town hall, and we had a regular. We had a big name band that Germans made up. We had a maid. It was called Nine Commission Officers Club. And. It was just what we had big acts from all around Europe, guys tightrope walking and everything. And I took, finally I got a girl there I liked, so I took her in a air, I could get the air compressor easier than I could anything else. So I had this air compressor, go pick her up, take her to the dance. <laughs> and I was telling Kathleen coming over, the saddest thing I ever saw while I was in Heidelberg, well two sad things. One was, we had a bunch of Germans working for us. Uh, they were out on the stringers, which are the things below the bridge that before you put the top on. And they were cutting small boards with a, a buzz saw that air compressor ran. A was one of circular saw. And the guy cut off fingers, boom, just like that. They dropped into the river. He held his hand. He stood up and he walked right off. Then bat an eye. Just cut, that was that. But the worst thing was uh, refugees. There was loads of that, displaced persons. And uh, at night, the, the one I was telling her about was a tractor 
pulling a bunch of farm wagons. And then the wagons sat, all these people are going back to where they were going. And at night, they, this one night, they stayed in, in the road right across the river from where we were working. So I would buy them in the morning, and uh, they were all in there. They had their breakfast, I suppose, and they were all climbing back into their little wagons. And the truck started off, and one little girl, she must be about 17, fell between two of them and got her leg caught, and they couldn't stop because of the noise. So they dragged her face down. Well, whew, she died, and her whole face was a black top, which is almost removed. But that's the way things were. That, too bad, but she's dead. And that was sad. All right. Uh, after the war, our outfit was told we could uh, help clear the Rhine River for boat traffic. And the reason for it was that uh, the Germans had blown just about every bridge so they could not get boats up and down the river. So they gave us a bridge, to take, a railroad bridge, and uh, they gave my platoon uh, that job to move that bridge. So we got a half a dozen bulldozers and we rigged up, we cut the bridge here, and we rigged up a uh, mechanical advantage of about six or eight, I forget which, and we started to pull with the bulldozers. Well, the bridge didn't move, but the bulldozers sunk in the ground. So that was no good. So step two, the captain said, why don't we try to blow it up? And the parts would go in the, in the ride, and they could flow over them. That's a good idea. So what we did, we <coughs> got a sea mule, and we uh, put tons of TNT in what they call uh, sea mule square things, like a landing block, and put, dropped it right down into the water, in the bridge. And the idea was you take a 55 gallon drum, load it with TNT, but this didn't happen till after we thought we were going to blow it up like this with a plunger. Well, they uh, told all the women in town to uh, take their dishes off the shelves, this big explosion is going to happen. And they had the Pathé News and they had everybody waiting to see this big of explosion. Result was we pushed out, nothing happened. Oh, they all laughed and they all left and there's the bridge sitting out there with all this explosive in it. So the Captain Smart says to me, he says, you keep your platoon here. He said, we'll send all the uh, explosive you want. And he said, uh, you see if you can blow it up. Well, for two weeks, we put loads of 50 Kaipion drums with, loaded with TNT, had a sea mule, would go up to the drop point, light the fuse, drop it in, and beat it downstream. And boom, you see a little explosion, boom. And it got to be routine, but we had a lot of explosives. So we were there about two weeks. Finally, one day it hit. And we didn't expect it, neither did anybody else. Well, what an explosion that was. And the result was that the ladies' dishes did fall off the shelves. But we were done, and the river became navigable. Well, that's a good story. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. But I, I tell you, I was no World War hero, but I did have a lot of experiences I'm glad I had. And it was worth worthwhile. And when I went to war, I was sure would win, so I didn't have any problem with that. Uh, today, the enemy, you don't even know what he looks like. Our guys all had suits. We knew which was the bad guys. <laughs> today, they look like civilians. I know, I know. Don't know who they are. I can't. Go ahead. I it's all That's all right. <laughs> I'm with you. Is there anything else you'd like? Um, I, mean, uh, I left from a, a camp. I believe it was Lucky Strike. The, the import, deportation, or what do you call it, when you leave France, 
Yeah, the t ports were named after cigarettes. Cigarettes were a big thing. Uh, when I was joined the Army, I went to the doctor for my physical. He said, do you drink or smoke? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, you will. And he was right. I did drink and I did smoke. And uh, we left, I think it was Lucky Strike. And we, this time we were on, the, I went over on the Highland Monarch, a British ship, and I went back on the Stinkin' Lincoln, which was a American victory ship. And in it, you can see where the German prisoners that were being sent back to Germany had written messages on a bulkhead, like, we had an affair with your wife, only they said it different things. And they had all kind of stuff to shoot it. They knew we'd be coming on the other way. <clears throat> anyway, going across, we had all kind of trouble with heavy seas and water coming down. A guy stole one of my uh, things I was bringing home. I don't know where I ever got to. And by the time the boat landed, about four guys had all the money. I didn't play poker then, but they cleaned out the boat. There were a couple of rich guys. We get to uh, New York. There's a thing called Ambrose Light. Well, we saw that. They said, that's Ambrose Light. Next stop, you're going to see a Statue of Liberty, and we'll be home. Okay, we get off the thing, they sick us on a train, and we go to Indian Town Gap, the same place I enlisted, or go in. And I uh, told my parents, I'll be home by my birthday. And it was absolutely, my birthday is when I got home, 28th January, 46. And I told them, keep the Christmas tree up, because I want to see it. So we, we always had a little Christmas tree. So when I get home, there is a box for me, and what it is is shoes. I finally get out of my army boots, and I sit down with a plunk to put them on, and every needle fell off that tree. <laughs> we had nothing but a bear tree, but it was a great homecoming. It was, uh, then I, would, I wore out my uh, army pants because I didn't buy new ones for a while, and uh, I still got my jacket I wore at home, and it doesn't fit anymore, of course. I was built different then, and that was fun. Anyway, that's what happened Christmas, and that was when I got home. And they were the days when taxi cab rides were peanuts, you could take them just like a, a bus. I said, North Philly Station home, I think was about a buck and a half. Now it would be about 50 bucks. So there you go.